together and work. But now they fall 
But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet. I know the night won't Church, let's declare this together this morning. so much that that's true that we can sing that out with confidence that you've never failed us 
and you never will. God, thank you so much for your love for us. It is so undeserving. And thank you that we can look in the past and see that you've been faithful. You've been faithful to your people and you've been faithful to us in our lives. And we know that you will be faithful no matter what we're going through, no matter how dark things seem. We know that you are in control and you know how it ends. And we know how it ends because you hold the victory. Thank you. Please help us to believe and trust that just a little bit more this morning. We continue to sing out praise and worship to you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. Thriving churches, spiritual revival, and the Great Awakening, New England has now become the most spiritually dark region in the United States. Portland, Maine, ranking as one of the darkest cities. The local church has gone from being the center of community to a landscape of white steeples and empty pews. And yet God's Spirit is doing a new thing. He's starting in His people. He's starting in the church. In recent years, God has brought a deeper understanding of His love a new hunger for His presence, and a renewed call for unity among the churches, especially the leaders. Right here in Greater Portland, pastors, ministers, preachers, and leaders have come together in humility to pursue unity for one common mission, making disciples of Jesus who impact our state, the state of Maine, for the kingdom of God. Leaders are recognizing that it's not through programs, buildings, events, or lights, but through prayer, repentance and fasting, that we would see a powerful move of God here in this region once again. For us here at East Point, we're not simply a local church, but we desire to be an impact church, a church family whose influence and resources have the ability to impact individuals and communities all across the region. In this season, we've sensed God's specific calling for us, a call to come alongside local churches who have vision beyond their resources and who are committed to impact Greater Portland for the Kingdom of God. Through the development of the Kingdom Impact Fund, we'll be able to further foster unity in this region, resource vision and mission here in Greater Portland, and not just build the name above our churches, but build the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Good morning, church. How are we this morning? Oh, good. You guys all have the turkey lulls this morning. We doing good this morning? It's the uh, first, this is the first Sunday of our joyful giving season for 2023. And we're excited this year to announce that we're developing the Kingdom Impact Fund, which we just heard a little bit about, to be able to come alongside churches whose vision far exceeds their resources. And so that means partnering with churches who are committed to the gospel, first and foremost. Churches who know that they can reach certain areas in their communities here in Greater Portland in ways that we can't, and churches who the gap is only resources. And so we've seen this play out in a mechanism called the GO Team for years. I think for over seven years, we've used the GO Team as a strategic financial injector into the community through social service partners, through nonprofits, and we're able to have them advocate for their clients, and we're able to use that advocacy to be able to help people towards betterment. It could be somebody looking for driver's ed or a laptop for education or even dental work. So for years, we've used the GO Team to be able to do that, but right now, we sense there are opportunities that we might not even fathom yet within the local church. Many of us know some of the local churches are just struggling. They might have one pastor or a part-time staffer, but they have people who are invested in the gospel transforming lives in greater Portland, and we want to be able to come alongside and help them out. Been able to meet with dozens and dozens of pastors in this region over the past couple years, and those whose hearts are for the people of greater Portland, we want to be able to maintain unity. We want to walk together because Jesus looks upon this region and doesn't just sit there and say, well done, East Point. He wants to see his bride flourish here in Greater Portland. He wants to see a church that's thriving and committed to unity and committed to being on mission for his people, living in the Great Commission. And so the Kingdom Impact Fund is near and dear to my heart. Kurt Holmgren, a bunch of our staff members are going to be working together to develop this. And we're going to be, at the first of the year, injecting monthly into this fund so that way we can have a pool of money to be able to help support local churches with a team that oversees all of those decisions. So this year for Joyful Giving is going to be one big injection into the Kingdom Impact Fund so that way we can start the beginning of the year and invest in the local church here in Greater Portland. 
It could be through existing churches. It could be through churches that are planting. It could be churches that are revitalizing. And we're not going to be investing in boilers, roofs, and facilities. We're investing in lives. <laughs> lives transformed. So a friend of mine is looking to be able to do impact in Westbrook through his local church. And they're in desperate need of some hardware to be able to do something downtown in the park and the River's Edge Park. And we say, we can come alongside and help you do that to reach these families in Westbrook. There's others that are looking to run starting point groups and alpha groups downtown on the peninsula and they want to engage people, but there's financial barriers and they're just starting out. We can come in and we can take that barrier away. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the name above our door. It is about the name above every name, the name of Jesus, amen? And so for us, the Kingdom Impact Fund... It's going to be a really exciting thing. We did the same thing with the Go team a few years ago, and we were able to build almost $70,000 towards the year end to be able to use for that next year. And it made such a way to be able to use the Go team, and we pray this is going to be the same way for this fund. And so if you're looking to begin giving for the first time, I can't think of a better time to do it because 10% of all of our year end giving is going to go to this fund. So $1 out of every 10 is going to go to help the local church increase in its impact here in greater Portland. And if you're looking toward your year-end giving, if you're looking toward what does it look like to give back to the Lord, this is an excellent opportunity because at the same time, we're setting up for the first of the year to be able to make greater impact than we ever have in the history of the church. And so we're excited this year for joyful giving. We're prayerful. Know that this is not a campaign. We're not going to have numbers and metrics and we're not going to have a big thermometer that's going to build like the United Way. No, this is, a, this is an effort of prayer. God, what would you do through your local church here? And how can we be increasingly generous to this community to impact it in Jesus' name? And so that's the direction for joyful giving. It'll be every Sunday between now and December 31st is the final Sunday of the month. And so all giving starting today through the end of the year, 10% of that will go towards this fund. And so previously, two years ago, $810,000 was given in the year end. $81,000 went to Mainly Teeth. Last year, over $790,000 was given year end. Over $79,000 went to Family Restored. And this year, we're just expectant to be able to invest in the local church, to be able to come alongside these wonderful leaders and be able to help their vision come to a reality because we can provide the resources. There's another way that you can participate this year in Christmas, and it's providing Christmas for a little kid through the root cellar. So I've got these tags in my hand. They're on a well-lit, kind of crooked Christmas tree out in the foyer. And you can grab a tag, and then these represent a kiddo in the root cellar community. And it gives sizes, ages. So this boy is age 15. He needs a coat size that's a men's large. His boot size is 13. And he'd love a set of headphones. So you can grab one of these tags if you and your family want to adopt a kiddo this year and help support what the root sellers do in downtown and up in Lewiston. You can, provide, you can grab one of these tags. We just need this stuff back, just in bags. It doesn't need to be wrapped. This stuff just back in the foyer. We're going to have a place to be able to bring it in on December 15th. So if you grab one of these tags, the time is ticking. December 15th, the bus will be loaded on the 16th, and we're going to head out. And if there's, there's late gifts, then I have to drive them over to the root cellar which I wouldn't mind doing. So there's a couple ways to be generous here at East Point. You can be generous through impacting a local nonprofit like the Root Cellar. You can be generous by participating in joyful giving. You can be generous by saying, hey, how can I use my time and my talents in this year end and as we go into the new year? But I just pray that our church family continues increasing this culture of generosity because we serve a God who is the most generous, the author of generosity through his son Jesus for us. And so as we think toward that night that Jesus was born, that Christmas morning, that the darkness of night lifted on all the souls and all of creation because hope was born, man, may we have that heart of generosity for the people around us like God did for us. So you can give in the black giving boxes on your way out. You can give online, eastpoint.church, or you can give in the app. However you choose to do it, I pray you do it cheerfully and prayerfully in the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you just sheerly grateful. 
we can't muster up generosity. We can't strive toward it. Only you can birth it within us. And so, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit just does this powerful work in us where we're able to open our hands. We're able to be worry-free, cheerfully and joyfully giving because we know who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It's you, Father. And so would you birth in this church family something so new in the way of generosity that it's talked about all throughout the state, all through the region, that this local church collected so that they could give to local churches in the region. So, Father, may we have a legacy of impact. May we have a legacy of open-handedness. And may you, Holy Spirit, have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. And now it's my absolute privilege to welcome you to stand to your feet to look at your neighbor and ask him, what are you doing for Christmas? Good morning, good morning. You could go ahead and find your seats this morning. That is a good holy buzz in the room to hear everybody talking. Hey, Emery, good to see you. Well, I hope you all had an amazing Turkey Day, an amazing Thanksgiving. It is official. We're 29 days out from Christmas. Woo! Anyone have their Christmas decorations up yet? Yeah? Overachievers in the room. Anyone waiting until the last week to put your stuff up? Yeah, I resonate with you, honest people in the room here. Beautiful, beautiful. And hey, just a reminder, next Saturday, we have our Christmas fair. So we'd love for you to be there. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Invite your neighbors, invite your friends, bring people along. And if you feel so led, we could use some help with volunteers as well. So you can go over to the serve booth on your way out and, and sign up for volunteering with the Christmas Fair if you'd like to do that as well. I heard some people in the room that sound kind of like me this morning. Uh, some of us may have a little tickle in our throat that's been coming out as this horse cough this time of year. So... If I cough on stage this morning, just say a little prayer, ignore it, don't let, you distract, don't let it distract you from the message or anything like that, and maybe just say like an amen or filler or something like that if I, if I cough this morning. But together, we're going to be continuing on in our series called Simple Kingdom. And I got to tell you guys, this series, it's, it's near and dear to my heart because I remember in my preteen years, I was investigating the person of Jesus for myself, and I was um, prodded and invited to read a gospel for myself. And for the first time, I read a gospel, one of the four gospels, all the way through. And the book I chose was the Gospel of Matthew. 
And I can remember reading through the Sermon on the Mount, what we're going through here, and thinking to myself, okay, Jesus has an x-ray machine on my soul. He sees right through me. He sees my inner thoughts. He sees my inner desires. There's no hiding away from this guy, Jesus. And maybe some of you, as we're going through this series, you feel that way a little bit too. Because Jesus, he knows how prone to anger we are. He knows the lustful thoughts that can be swirling around in our minds. He knows how easily we can justify things like divorce. He knows how um, just uh, worried we can get about the future, about everything and anything. And at times, this spotlight that Jesus shines on us through his teachings, it can be a little uncomfortable at times, right? But the reality is it's, it's so important for us because as Jesus is shining this, this spotlight of truth on us, it's helping us realize, man, I need to live into the ways of Jesus in my life. Many of us were realizing the world would be a much better place if we lived into the ways of Jesus. But it's also important for us to be exposed to this spotlight of truth because it shows us our need for grace. Because Jesus, as we're looking through the Sermon on the Mount, he's setting a pretty high bar for many of us, right? And we're realizing, man, I fall short of that time and time again. And so we realize our need for the grace of Jesus. And so as we're continuing on in in our passage today in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to be looking at another area of human nature, you could say, that Jesus is shining a light on this morning, and that is judging people, judging other people, right? Judging people, it's kind of part of our nature, kind of part of the human experience, right? Sometimes we judge people based on what they're wearing or what they're, they're not wearing. Sometimes we judge people on the cars that they're driving. Sometimes we judge people on the bumper stickers on the back of their cars. Well, let's be real, those people are kind of asking for it, right? <laughs> we're, we're constantly judging other people. And the thing is, judging kind of comes easy to us because judging is, is easy. It's, it's easy to do. It's easy to throw an opinion out there because judging, it's, it's easy, especially when we don't have skin in the game. Many of us, we've probably heard of the term Monday morning quarterback before, right? If I was at that one yard line, I totally would have ran the ball instead of throwing that slant pass. What were they thinking? I know I've done this many times in my life. I've been a Monday, Monday morning quarterback in my life. In my mind, I knew I was the best parent when I didn't have kids. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I was the best parent. When I have kids, I'll never raise my voice. When they're having temper tantrums, I'll always be really patient and I'll let them calm their little bodies down. I'll never zone out on my phone or, or let them uh, watch the TV for too long when I'm feeling like I need a, a break to myself. I was the best parent in my mind. And then I had kids. And I'm constantly sick, because kids are germ bags. <laughs> and I'm constantly tired and getting interrupted sleep. And those perfect picture of myself as a parent was popped so quickly when reality set in. Now I feel like I have to like write a letter to my parents apologizing for all the things I did as a kid. <laughs> Maybe I need to start paying for their counseling or something like that. <laughs> but judging is easy, right? It's easy. It's, e it's even easier now that we have social media, right? Talk about a scary combo. Now, all of our religious, political, social opinions, we can just have a platform for all of our judgy opinions just one fingertip away, one send away. And so rather than having to navigate a challenging conversation with somebody and maybe have the risk of having our mind being changed, 
we can easily just lob digital grenades about our opinion back and forth from the comfort of our home. It's easy to do, it's comfortable to do, but it's also causing a lot of divisions and challenges in our society. Judging is easy, but it's not just easy. Sometimes, let's be real, judging feels good, right? Judging feels good. It's our fleshly nature to judge ourselves based on how the people around us are doing. How fit are they? What kind of home do they have? How are their kids behaving compared to my kids? And we don't always need to feel like we're doing the best in all of these departments, but we don't want to be the worst, right? And so very quickly, we can get insecure and we can start to tear other people down, whether it's out loud or whether it's in our mind or especially sometimes behind their back. We can tear them down to make ourselves feel less insecure, to make ourselves feel better. And for a short period of time, sometimes it, it feels good, but then the insecurities, they start to creep their way back in and the cycle continues again. See, Jesus knows that judging is very much part of our nature. It can be easy, it feels good, and it can cause a lot of damage if we're not careful. But as we jump into our passage in Matthew chapter 7 today, we're going to see some criteria that Jesus gives us around how and if we should judge other people. So if you have one, you can open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking through verses 1 through 5. It's going to be on the screen as well. And feel free to follow along. It says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And if you... And with the measure you use, it'll be used to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So the first thing that Jesus here, we see about judging, if we break it up into its parts in this passage, is he says this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Now, this is probably one of the most misunderstood and taken out of context passages in the Bible. I've heard people say things like, Graham, who who are you to judge me, right? Doesn't the Bible say, judge not lest ye be judged, right? Some of these people, they they may have never been to church before, but they have this one memorized in King James Version. (laughs) Doesn't it say, judge not lest, lest ye be judged? But it's clear here that Jesus isn't saying that we should never judge. In fact, later on in this same chapter, Jesus talks about be, being wary of false prophets. And how we'd recognize them is, he says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So in order to do that, we need to be able to rightly judge others. Instead, what Jesus is saying is, is really clear. He says, don't judge unless you're ready to be judged back. Because the measure you dish it out to other people, that's how it's going to be measured back to you. Right, this is an important lesson here because many times in our human nature, what we do is when it comes to judging other people, we have a teaspoon of grace, if that, for the people around us in our life, and we expect the dump truck of grace to back up and be unloaded into our situation. Right, we know we know this is true deep down. Oftentimes, when we sin, we're very aware of the humanity and the, the complexities around the situation that led us into our infrequent but unfortunate mistake that we made, right? We had a bad night's sleep. My boss yelled at me today at work. The traffic was really bad. And so because of all those things, I got so irritated. I got so built up that I had to do fill in the blank. God knows my heart. So unload the dump truck of grace onto my situation. But oftentimes, if we're honest with ourselves, 
we're not so gracious and loving and letting other people off the hook in their situations. I don't care if she's a single mom. You don't just let your kids run around like crazy on the playground and sit on your phone on the bench. I don't care if he's grieving. He passed away, his, his family member passed away two weeks ago. He's gotta get back to life, he's gotta get back to work, he's gotta get back on his feet. Many times we have this little teaspoon of grace for the people around us. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can even hold people hostage with our judgments. Sometimes we can say, yes, I'll give you my teaspoon of grace, but first I want you to crawl through this bed of coals, then climb that mountain barefoot, and then write, I'm the worst 50 times on this whiteboard, then I'll give you my teaspoon of grace. See, when we do this, when we judge others harsh, harshly, what we do is we remove their humanity from the situation. And we forget things like, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I might be in that situation myself. I could easily be there myself. So Jesus is reminding us that if we're, if we're prone to judge other people harshly, if we're prone to giving out little teaspoons of grace, if that, then we need to be careful because the measure we use will be measured back to us. And if you mess up, and you likely will eventually mess up, don't be surprised if you don't hear the dump truck backing up to pour out grace in your situation. Jesus says it best in his own words. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. But Jesus, he's, he's not done here because he makes an important follow-up point that is so important because Jesus, he knows his audience. And he knows in the audience there's a bunch of people who are the Pharisees in the religious elite. And they're, they're thinking, I don't need a teaspoon of grace. I don't even need a dump truck of grace. In fact, I'm doing pretty good in God's eyes. They're self-righteous. They're right in their own eyes. And the, and the scary thing is when we're self-righteous is we get prideful. And when we're prideful we get blind spots. And so Jesus, he brings an important caveat point after the first one. He says this, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's a pretty humorous picture here, right? It's almost like, okay, Mr. Strondack, we're here for your eye appointment. <laughs> it's like, get away from me right now with that plank in your eye. And Jesus, he's, he's exaggerating the picture to make the point of how silly we look when we're self-righteously hypocritical towards others. You know, a telltale sign that we have a plank in our own eye is when we spotlight the sins of the people around us, the sins that we deem worse than ours, and we, we give ourselves a pass. We compartmentalize and we, we give ourselves a pass on the sins that we think are more acceptable, usually the less visible sins. So we might elevate the sin of hookup culture, right? While brushing pornography under the rug. Oh, that's no big deal. Who is that, that really hurting? We may elevate the sin of colorful language, but we may sweep gluttony under the rug. I mean, who doesn't go for fourths on Thanksgiving? Give me a break. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to take any of these sins off the table. They're all sins but we start to get the plank in our eye when we get comfortable with the select few sins in our life that we feel like we have managed and tucked away and are out of the plain view of other people. And so Jesus says, if you're doing that, you have a plank in your eye. Don't go around trying to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so maybe you're thinking, what, what do we do in this situation? 
Do we just throw Christian accountability out the window? Is it like the spiritual wild, wild west? Everyone can just do whatever they want. We're just kind of giving everyone a pass because we're all sinners. No, what does Jesus prescribe here? He says in verse five, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There's this story of a mother whose son ate way too much candy. And so she couldn't fix the problem, so she brought him to this uh, spiritual guru on the top of a mountain. And the spiritual guru hears the case of the mother and looks at the son and says, I want you to come back to me in two weeks and we can start getting to work. The mother's kind of confused and she walks her son back down and and they go home for two weeks and they, they come back to the spiritual guru and he says, okay, we can start now. And the mother, she pulls the spiritual guru aside and she goes, wait, what happened in the last two weeks? Why couldn't you take my son two weeks ago and now you're taking him now? And the guru said, I had to stop eating candy first, (laughs) right? I love that because he realizes he needs to take the plank out of his own eye if he's going to help this boy with the speck in, in his eye. And oftentimes, if we have the plank in our eye and we're trying to help other people, even if it's out of good intentions, what we do is we hurt the person because we have no empathy, we have no understanding, we have no real knowing of what the situation is like and what it may be like to get over the situation they're dealing with. And then what's worse is we're eaten up on the inside by our conscience. Our guilty conscience attacks us. And so Jesus says, if you want to get out of this trap, you need to take the plank out of your own eye. But how do we do that? How do we take the plank out of our own eye? The first step to taking the plank out of your own eye is doing what the the Pharisees couldn't do. It's recognizing that you are just like every other human to ever walk the face of the earth except for Jesus. That you're just like me. That we're spiritually broken and hurting and we're in desperate need from the grace of Jesus, that you're just like us, that you're just like me. And on top of that, it's understanding that what Jesus said right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And why would Jesus say that? It's because we have to realize that we have a lack in our heart. We have a lack in our life that only God can fill. And when we're prideful, when we're self-righteous, We can't be poor in spirit. And so we have to come to God with humility saying, I'm a sinner, just like everybody else, in need of the grace of Jesus. I'm broken too. The second step to taking the plank out of our eye is the same as getting something out of your teeth when you have food in your teeth. It's taking a hard look in the mirror. And for us as Christians, the mirror is the word of God and it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us this about the Holy Spirit's role as believers in in John 16, 8. He says this, "When, when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So Jesus is showing us that part of the Spirit's role is to convict us of our own sin. And it comes along our con- in, with our conscience and it says things like, you really need to stop scrolling on social media so much. There's more to life than the screen time. Or maybe the spirit will say things like, you need to stop watching the show. This is not putting good thoughts in your mind. Maybe the spirit will will say something like, this thing, this person is becoming an idol in your life and you need to reprioritize and you need to put Jesus back on the throne of your heart. And so the, the spirit will search our heart, the spirit will search our mind But that in tandem with scripture, when you're reading the scripture, it's like a sword that pierces our heart, soul, and mind, right? We read things about, oh, this is God's standard around marriage. I got a lot of changes I got to make. Or maybe we're, we're looking at it and we're saying, this is what Jesus says about forgiveness. I got some resentments in my life that I need to let go of. And as we look in the the mirror of God's word in tandem with allowing the Holy Spirit to convict our heart daily, day by day, 
we can look in the mirror and we can take the plank out of our eye. And from that position, when we've looked at ourselves in the mirror with letting the Holy Spirit search our hearts, looking into the word of God, when we've taken the plank out of our own eye, it's from that place that if it's appropriate, in love, with humility, we can remove the speck from our brother or our sister's eye. And oftentimes what that looks like, it's, it's not saying, you know you shouldn't be doing that. That's wrong. Stop, stop sleeping together outside of marriage. Instead, what it looks like is, hey, come look in the mirror with me. Come look at what God's word has to say about his blueprint, his perfect design for sexuality. Hey, I know it's, it's tempting to get the last word in every argument, but I want you to look at the scripture with me. See what it says about a man who is making a hasty word, who speaks out of anger. And so when we're looking in the mirror ourselves, we can help other people look in the same mirror that judges us. We can help them look at the perfect standard, not our opinions, but the standard of God's holy word. And Jesus makes it clear. He goes on in verse 6, sometimes you're going to present people with the truth, and they're not going to want to hear it. It's like throwing your pearls before pigs and dogs. They don't see the value of those pearls. They're going to eat them up or trample them, and then they might trample you next. So Jesus is telling us there's a point of diminishing return, and be tactful and smart about how you bring the truth if you're going to judge somebody else. Be, be smart about that. There is a point of diminishing return, but God will show you where that point comes. But what is non-negotiable is that whenever we go to judge somebody else, whenever we bring somebody else the truth, what we want to do is we want to bring it with humility after looking in the mirror ourselves and taking the plank out of our own eye so we can love them with true and right standards. So Jesus' criteria for us, if we're going to judge, he says, don't judge, number one, unless you're ready for the measure to be used back against you. And number two, don't judge unless you've looked in the mirror and you've taken the plank out of your own eye. As we close, I think the principles that Jesus brings up here in Matthew 7 are perfectly portrayed in an encounter he has in John 8 with a woman who is in a very tricky predicament, and it's a heated situation. This is what it says starting in verse 1. It says this in John 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, uh, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Now, I want to take a pause really quick because there's a few things that we should note in this story already. Number one, it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to recognize this. You're wondering, where's the guy, right? She's caught in the heat of adultery here. But we know there needs to be a guy present for that to be the case, which is just kind of pointing out how hypocritical and the motives that the Pharisees have as they're accusing this woman and bringing her to Jesus. She's a pawn that they're using to trap Jesus. And they're trying to get Jesus in a rock in a hard place by saying, hey, Jesus, are you going to follow the law of Moses? and allow us to stone this woman. But as you do that, are you gonna alienate all of your followers who you've been talking about needing grace and mercy and forgiveness? And so Jesus, he's kind of in this rock and a hard place. He's in this, in this trap, but Jesus in the most genius way steps above the situation. And this is what he does. It says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone who is without sin 
be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, this is one of the great Bible mysteries that many of us scratch our head about here. What did Jesus write on the ground here in this, in this situation? We don't, we don't know. It could be a fun question to ask Jesus when you, when you get to heaven. Jesus, what did you write on the ground in John chapter 8? What, what was that? Some people, they think Jesus was writing down the Ten Commandments because the only other time we see God writing something with his finger in the Bible is when he writes the Ten Commandments on the tablet with his finger. And so he's convicting them of their sin, writing the Ten Commandments. Some people think he's just writing out their sins right in front of them because he's Jesus and he knows their thoughts, he knows their hearts. We don't, we don't know for sure, but what, what we do see in this passage is the planks in these accusers' eyes start to get bigger and more real very quickly. It says this as we keep going. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. So here we are, a bunch of people with planks in their eyes accusing this woman. And they don't want to just give her a teaspoon of grace. They have no grace to give at all. They want her dead. They want to stone her. And the only person present who has the right to judge this woman, to throw a stone at her, is Jesus, the perfect son of God. And what does he say in this situation? He says, neither do I condemn you. He doesn't condemn her. But in the perfect fatherly way that only Jesus really could, he still judges her. Did you catch that? He says, now go and leave your life of sin. I think Jesus, before our eyes, creates such an important distinction that we need to make and that we need to recognize in our relationship with God. Because the voice of God is not a voice of condemnation. Because what condemnation does is says, you made a mistake and you're never going to get over it. You made a mistake and now your past defines you. Oftentimes the voice of condemnation sounds a lot like shame. I messed up. Therefore, I'm a mess up. I can't be redeemed. I can't be changed. I can't have grace in my life. I wonder this morning if some of us here have been hearing the voice of condemnation and it's been beating us up in our life. It's been keeping us in our past. And I think Jesus this morning is saying, you need to open up that door. You need to walk out. It's time to turn the page. It's time to move forward. Because the voice of God is not one of condemnation. Instead, what does Jesus do? He shows mercy to this woman. And he loves her. But he still brings the truth to her. He says, go and leave your life of sin. He shows godly judgment. And it's godly judgment because it's characterized by love. And so as Jesus' uh, followers, <laughs> not fathers, followers, if we're ever going to judge someone else, it should always be characterized by love. It should always be characterized by recognizing I'm not perfect. I have sinned in my life too. I can forgive, I can show mercy, but I'm still gonna bring you the truth. I'm still gonna say, hey, there's a better option for us. Anyone here thankful that God loved us so much, but he loved us too much to keep us that way, right? He's giving us a new future. He's saying, hey, walk out of those chains, walk out of that past and walk into a, a new future with me. Walk in the light where it's brighter. You can watch where you're walking. And so Jesus, he doesn't condemn, but he still is a godly judge. And so many of us, we can take that on ourselves this morning. 
And as we go into a time of communion, we can remember that in some ways, we were all like this woman here, caught in adultery. We were all caught in our sin. And the enemy brought us before the courts of God and said, here's the fines, here's the sins stacked up against them. Are you gonna drop the gavel and are they gonna have an eternity separated from God? But what Jesus did is while we were still sinners, he came down to this earth. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He died a gruesome death, the death that we deserve, paying for our sin, paying our punishment on the cross. And then he rose again three days later, promising us eternity with God forever. He showed us a different type of judgment, a godly judgment. And so as we take communion, we remember that all of us were like that woman. We all deserved judgment, but we were spared. And so as we go into our time of communion, I just want to have a couple reflection questions to ask you. And the first one is, is there any areas of your life where you're expecting a dump truck of grace to get poured out on you but you're just giving teaspoons of grace to the people around you? Is there any areas of life where your measurement that you're giving out judgment-wise is not what you would expect in return? Ask the Lord that. And then ask God, are there any sins? Are there any planks in your eye? Are there any areas of sin in your life that you've compartmentalized away, tucked away, because you didn't think they were a big deal or you didn't think they were as bad as this sin or that sin out there? Are there any planks in your eye that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you this morning that it's time to take out and remove and repent of? So let's ask ourselves those questions here for a few seconds. As we take communion together, we remember Jesus who broke his body for us, taking the punishment that we deserve. Let's take the bread now. And then on the cross, his blood was poured out, shed for the forgiveness of our sin. Let's take that together. Let's pray before we go into worship. Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and God, we thank you for your words and how true they are. And God, we recognize that when we apply them to our life, it leads to life and life to the full. God, this morning, we ask for forgiveness for any areas that we've been judging in ungodly standards. God, any ways that we've been dishing it out to other people way more than we would expect on ourselves. And God, forgive us if we have any sins in our life that we've been tucking away and compartmentalizing while still pointing out the sins in other people's lives. Hypocritically, God, forgive us for that. And Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that while we were lost in our sin, while we were your enemies, that Jesus, you came, lived the perfect life, and died for us, that you forgave us when we deserve judgment. Help us to have that same heart for the people around us, even some of the people who are hardest to love and hardest to forgive God, because we know that's the way of freedom. That's the way of life. God, we love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and worship together.
darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle bittersweet announcement to make to you all. Um, this is Andy. Usually he's kind of behind the scenes, but I just wanted to bring him forward really quick. So Andy, this is, he's been faithfully playing the keys. He does such a great job for probably years now here in this church, five or six years. 
and this is his last Sunday with us as a church family. So it's definitely bittersweet. Uh, but can we just give Andy some thanks for just the service he's put in and how he's doing? So Well, as we close out today, make sure you, you go get one of those tags from the Christmas tree. If you have more questions about our church and how you can get plugged in, come see us at the booths or in Discovery's Point. And as we close, I just want to keep it simple. Let's remember there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And let's pass it along to those around us. Yeah. All right. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys.